Morning. Good morning. Oh, I've got a key in. Girl. Oh, I don't want the key. Oh, there it is. Hang on. Stand by. Stand by one. I'm in gear. Or aware of the national guard. Radio's on. Cars coming. You let me out. Oh, what a day. Already 10 things have gone wrong. And the camera's only been on one minute. What's she up to? Well, like, it's, a, it's a pastime looking out for suspicious people in the country. Keep an eye on them. You can't uh, evade being surveilled if you're hanging around people's houses in the country. I think it's because there's like you know there's quite a lot of theft in the country, and people in towns want to get up to mischief. If they decide to get out of the town, get to the country. Not there's a lot. I mean, what can you do? Like pinch an apple. I mean, what can you do really? Have a wee apple tree. There's not much, not much mischief you can, most mischief you can get to in the country is dumping old mattresses and tyres. <coughs> it tends to be the new national pastime. Now, I'm just going to get my mirror in, hang on. You know the routine. You've done this journey as many times as I have. Get the old mirror in, and that's it. There's a Vauxhall behind me. Vauxhall keep coming up with ways of sort of trying to make their cars look smart. But they just never they've never got it, have they? They've never got the you know the, I don't know, it's never gonna be a premier mark Vauxhall. Yeah, I think it all dates back to the days of Red Robbo throwing nuts and bolts up and down the British Leyland factory. People sort of uh, decided at that point they weren't didn't want to have anything to do with British manufactured cars, and uh, that's persisted, you know, for the best part of 40 years, 50 years now probably. So what should we talk about today? Well, let's have a thing. We had a few good, interesting cases in. I had a guy who came in with a very, very uh, tight, painful swelling, lower front teeth. Obviously, first thing that goes through your mind when you're considering the differential diagnosis for that is something like AUG, uh, a, a gum disease, very un, uncommon now, but I've seen a case at once case of it this year so far, which is quite a, an aggressive and gum destroying bacterial infection that uh, tends to afflict teenagers, you know, people in their 20s. And we don't know why. Uh, it's some sort of uh, bacterial infection that gets out of control and gets super infected by this uh, uh, germ that uh, is literally very, very good at destroying the gums. With a very characteristic halitosis and uh, what they call punched out into papillary uh, areas and needs to be treated urgently, as in, you know, two or three days delay causes a lot of trouble um, with um, metronidazole is the drug of choice I don't know if it still is whoosh uh, but in fact it turns out he's got a non-vital lower incisor and that again is a very very odd uh, syndrome I suppose you know where you get someone who comes in with a with a, a single dead lower incisor tooth and sometimes it's uh, brown. In his case, uh, the tooth itself, the, the enamel didn't, you know, the tooth in appearance wasn't that different from all the other teeth. With a single exception that it had a, on the top, where the dentine was poking through the enamel, only just poking through the enamel, the dentine was obviously brown. On that, just on that one tooth. So we diagnosed the condition and also which tooth was causing it um, solely on 
you know, like a, a strip of exposed dentine, about 0.2 millimeters wide and about one millimeter across. So, anyway, uh, the <clears throat> solution for that was to um, take an x-ray, obviously, to confirm the diagnosis, and then without any local anaesthetic, because it's not necessary, we, um, we uh, open up the tooth, and then you shove a 20 reamer up it, being careful not, you know, you have to be a little bit circumspect about, you know, all, all you want to do is make, make a patent hole for the infection to drain up and then and then all of a sudden of course you get a whoosh of pus and blood up the tooth and and the best thing about it is the patient after five or ten minutes says because uh, it takes five or ten minutes to realize that the, the pressure's gone and the pain starts to settle down a bit that the pain is pretty well instantly relieved um, so that's a good technique now now once again I mean there's a guy who wasn't a patient of ours and had uh, technically got a dentist who said they, there's no way that they can see them that there's no possibility that they could see them um, and then and couldn't get accepted anywhere else and so once again we've ended up being the NHS emergency service um, you know I mean okay uh, I was gonna say you know we charge for this but in fact we don't we don't charge we charge him his standard 45 pounds examination uh, which which is just a standard examination fee for anybody and uh, the x-ray and the uh, relief of pain is included we did free of charge so in fact we're acting as the NHS emergency service and doing the emergency work free of charge um, all we gained out of it was um, uh, a checkup fee and, and a patient who hopefully is going to be loyal to us in future and go around and tell his friends you know if you want if you want some proper dentistry done then there's probably only a few decent dentists in the area and we're one of them um, uh, reputation is uh, key in dentistry you know you have to be you have to have integrity you have to have uh, 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 a reputation for being good at what you do and it goes without saying that you have to be good at what you do to get a reputation for being good at what you do, you know, it's no use handing out antibiotics like Smarties and and uh, doing uh, fillings that fall out and crowns that fall off and stuff like that, you know. Almost everything I do is, is you could almost say it's over-engineered, you know. We very rarely have any problems at all with any uh, crowns or fillings or anything because they're all over-engineered. One problem we're having at the moment which is again is an unusual problem but it's easily explainable is that we're having a large number of people coming in for fillings where the decay has got into the nerve on the tooth what we call a pulp exposure and uh, you know almost every filling we're doing we're getting exposures on which is unusual because normally we wouldn't normally we catch the fillings at an earlier stage um, but at the moment everything's everything's an exposure and I'm having to say to the people, like, before we do the fillings, like, you know, it's likely that the decay's in the nerve on this tooth and that I can fill it, but you, you're probably going to need a root filling. That's going to be involve additional expense and cost, or, or in which case you might uh, decide to have the tooth taken out instead, in which case you'll, you'll end up paying for a filling which on a tooth, which then is later taken out at extra expense. So there's no really good uh, route, you know, uh, around this for and it's entirely due to lockdown it's entirely due to the fact that people have not uh, attended as much and therefore the problems are now at, at a more advanced stage um, I mean talking of things that went well again we had a young lad well I say young lad about 30 in yesterday uh, needed a DO doing in his lower right five was a tooth that um, on the face of it from a checkup hardly looked like uh, anything wrong with it at all you know perhaps a tiny little bit of dark staining down the lower right five do pit fissure and uh, but on the x-ray uh, completely um,
on the x-ray, uh, make your minds up, all right. On the x-ray, completely um, shot, you know, massive grade distal cavity. Uh, I mean, I'd like to say that uh, it, it's got to that point where, you know, because it was had been difficult to diagnose and bloody great lorries, and possibly some somebody had, uh, you know, had, might have, uh, you know, I mean, really, only it was only diagnosable on bite wings, and the, but this guy just hadn't really had a checkup or had any bite wings, and so so that's why we picked it up. He came in because it was aching. Uh, in that area, you know, some sort of diffuse pain in that area which comes and goes and you know uh, that, you know, you've got some sort of nerve involvement in the tooth at that point, so you're talking root fillings probably but um, anyway, he's, obviously, he's a very nervous patient and um, we uh, you know, nervous to the point where he said, "Can he bring in his Walkman, whatever the whatever the youth today call? You know, we bring in some music, headphones, and that." So we brought in headphones, and um, we gave him an intraosseous injection, which, because he was young and fit, and you know, quite quite a good spaces between the roots, and his teeth went really well. So. Uh, we, you know, he, he, and he was going on about, oh, you know, feel really weird. And I couldn't feel it down the bottom, but I could feel drilling up the top, which is weird because I knew you weren't drilling the top and that. And then there's a guy who basically is just um, has never really had an injection and is just thinking how weird it is, you know, just thinking out how loud, how weird it is to be completely anaesthetised in in one part of his jaw. Um, anyway, he, he was, ended up being a happy customer, although he was a, he was a careless exposure again. Um, but um, what he's going to do is he's going to go and he's going to say, look, you know, this dentist is not like all other dentists. This dentist is, is uh, you know, for some reason has sort of got a, hello, black BMW. And somebody else said something to me yesterday about uh, this guy came in, uh, and he's what I call a super fan. You know, he's he's very. Uh, get me when we're out. He's a big fan of the surgery, and yeah, you know, whatever you say, whatever you say, I'll, you know, just you let me know, and I'll I trust you completely, and. Uh, and apparently, according to his wife, he's had a lot of problems with dentists in the past, and so it's like uh, what I always say is, if if you're getting exactly what you want, then cost is no never an objection. If you're not getting what you want, then you won't pay anything. You you can't give something away for nothing if it's not what patients want. So really, you just gotta when when uh, someone when you're sort of providing a service which is giving people. Uh, exactly what they want from a dentist, then really you don't have to worry too much about money. Um, but he's, um, his wife came in and she said, uh, and she was the same as him, you know, she was highly skeptical. And uh, and so, but she said her husband had said to her, look, you know, go and see Derek because you will find out, very quickly find out, that he doesn't sort of do dentistry in the way that other dentists do dentistry. He's like, and therefore, and her exact words were like, a, a crown, or a denture, a denture from Derek, is not gonna be the same as the sort of denture that you'd expect if you just went to another dentist. Um, by which, I, I think, I'm trying to interpret what he, was, what he meant there, and I don't think he meant that we do different type of dentures, that was the last thing he meant. Or that even that we were, um, uh, I think basically we were sort of trying to imply that we were like the last bastion of doing everything to a high standard, you know. I think he was trying to imply that uh, levels of slid overall to the point where, you know, when dentistry became commoditized in the, in the 80s and the 90s, um, standards you know that old sort of that old dentist who uh, you know
you know, took great pride in the profession and was genuinely annoyed when people said, oh, you know, did you become a dentist because you couldn't get into medical school and become a doctor and had all that immense technical knowledge, you know. I mean, we've lost all the technicians with, with the technical knowledge, or most of them. And uh, I think we're in, you know, we're in the last five or 10 years of losing all the dentists through retirement of um, who got that, uh, who joined dentist, who sort of went into dentistry because they, they wanted to become dentists, uh, either because their parents were dentists or they liked science or they liked meeting people or fixing problems. Uh, and, and ended up getting replaced by a, another generation of dentists who went into it because they saw it as a, a way to make a, a ton of money very quickly uh, after qualification, you know, that it was, of all the degree courses, it was probably one of the top half dozen degree courses in terms of guaranteed earnings. Uh, and that's why they went into it, for the earnings, not for the, there could have been anything. It could have been taxidermy far as they were concerned but you know you came out and earned eighty thousand pound gross in your first year and that that was the job for them whatever it was you know could have been could have been a lift concierge <laughs> and so they're they're just doing the dentistry they're just going through the motions of the dentistry to to get the money and they're only motivated to do good quality dentistry to the extent that it it maximizes the amount of money that they get <laughs> not interested in the subject in and of itself you know for its own sake so um, we had we had one failure who's a um, woman who rang up obviously in, in a lot of distress and a new patient and uh, had five teeth filed down for crowns front teeth and that was over a year ago and she had it done by um, at the London branch of a Hungarian dental chain and we've had problems with these Hungarian dental chains before um, we had in particular we had one woman who'd had an all-on four started and had had I think six implants placed in her upper jaw and then uh, uh, and, but, but no superstructure ever fitted and uh, you know, I tried to get in touch with these Hungarian guys. And I think they've obviously gone bust. I would imagine, or they're just shut and they just don't care about their foreign dentists, uh, the foreign patients. But anyway, she said these temporary crowns had all fallen off and they were sharp and they were rubbing her tongue and she couldn't talk and blah, blah. Although she did a pretty damn good job of it. Um, and did we, could we make temporary crowns? Did we do temporary crowns? So I said, you know, like quite a surprising question. You never really discount anything the patients might say. They always come up with something new. So did we do temporary crowns? I said, yeah, we do do temporary crowns. Did I think that I could make her some temporary crowns until such time as she can get in touch with these Hungarian guys because she loved them, they were really wonderful. She'd had a ton of really idiot, stupid dentists. And, but this practice was the only practice in the world that she loved and was so good to her and the dentists there were brilliant. And uh, so I said, yeah, I said, we can, we can get you in. I said, obviously we'd have to, we have to do a checkup. There's no, uh, there's no, <clears throat> I'm not, at all happy if patients try and micromanage the treatment. If they ring me up and say, I, I want an implant, how much does it cost to have an implant? I far rather they say, I've got a gap or I can't chew on the left hand side. Uh, could you have a, could you work me up a treatment plan? Um, but there, there's an increasing tendency now for the patients to try and to sort of choose what they want and then try and ring around, try and find a dentist and it and it trumps is never what they need it's never what they need <coughs> so anyway um, 
the reason why you have to do a checkup, incidentally, is the General Dental Council. They've drove, driven a coach and horses through direct access because basically they rule that um, you can't uh, get an informed consent of a patient if you haven't discussed all the options. And you can't discuss all the options if you haven't examined the patient. Therefore, if you haven't examined the patient, by default, you haven't got informed consent. Uh, so, so for example, even if the patient comes in and says, I want, I want an implant, and you say, yes, I agree, you need an implant, and you do an implant, then the GDC and the patient then complains. You, the, the, they will automatically win because the, the GDC will say, you didn't have informed consent for the implant. And they will cite the fact that you did not carry out an examination. Even though you may have carried out an examination sufficient for the purposes of, of placing the implant. So now we say uh, to, you know, which, which you might have done, but you might have, but I mean, technically if you say something in the notes like, I carried out an examination sufficient for the purposes of determining whether or not an implant was the best treatment, but then, without looking at the rest of the teeth, I don't see how you can argue that, you know, you gave them all their options, like dentures and stuff like that. So, it's a bit of a moot point. But, um, anyway, uh, we then informed her that, uh, so it'd be £45 plus the cost of entirely, off the top of my head, making five temporary crowns on an unknown uh, mouth on a patient who's obviously quite an active, uh, actively litigious, <laughs> and and generally got a very very poor um, <clears throat> idea of you know the profession. So, uh, um, and she said, "Oh, I'm not paying that. I'm not paying. I'm not going to pay up front. I should. I don't know you. I don't know you. I don't know what the quality of your work is." So the last two dentists I've been to, one charged me two hundred quid, and the other one charged me three hundred quid. And neither of them solved my problem, so I'm not. I'm not going to pay you 150 pounds in advance. You know. So here's a woman, right? Who's got no one will see. He's in a lot of, you know, says she's in a lot of pain and everything from these crowns. Has found a dentist who's willing to see her at short notice. Has spent a lot of time chatting with her, <clears throat> understanding the problem, and has given a quote which is less than both of the previous dentists. And she's then going to uh, not. She's then going to uh, blow blow the whole deal apart by refusing to pay uh, the fee. And uh, bearing in mind the appointment is cancelable up to one one working day. I even said to her, if if it turns out we do less work than we thought, um, I'll refund you the difference between what the the charge is and the 150 quid you paid. Oh no no, I'm not going to pay that. And so I said to her, in that case. We're not, um, we won't be doing business, you know, because that's, I mean, basically she didn't trust me and I didn't trust her, uh, you know, because I'm sure, I mean, she may well be completely trustworthy for all I know, but the other patients who've, uh, who said that they'll definitely come in and they'll definitely pay who then haven't turned up have really queered the pitch, haven't they, for her. She, she doesn't have me to blame for that. She has to blame her fellow patients who've, who've said that they're you know asked me to trust them and I've trusted them and, and they let me down so unfortunately she's got no goodwill to fall back on from that point of view but um, so so eventually, so eventually I think she realized what a mistake she'd made and she said look I'll give you I'll give you 50 quid you know in advance and I said look I'm sorry but it's, it's not gonna happen because I think the words I used were, it's not a natural fit. I said, I'd like to make sure that, um, you know, anyone who comes into the surgery is, is a natural fit for the practice. And I said, I don't think this is a natural fit. Um, <clears throat> and basically, which is just a polite way of saying, I can't be asked to deal with all this crap, you know, I can't. I, I've got nothing to prove. This is what it boils down to. After 40 years, and with a reputation like mine, and with my skills, I have got nothing to prove to someone like her, who, uh, and you always find, let me just turn there. You always find that these patients, they, they're, they're, their previous dentists fall into two groups. 
Those like old Mr. Sonso, he was lovely. He was my family dentist. We had him for 30 years. And then he retired and we were all devastated. And he was so, because he was so lovely. And then, <clears throat> and then I went to see a dentist, but he was shit. And then I went to see another dentist. Now he didn't have a clue what he was talking about. And then I went to see another dentist and he was useless, you know? And now I'm looking for another dentist. And you think, yeah, you're, I know which, I know which group I'm going to fall into. <laughs> Unless I, you know, by some fluke, you know, end up getting treated like old lovely Mr. Smith, the original one. Basically, um, uh, you know, you're on a hiding to nothing, aren't you? Trying to, why do you, why, why should you have to prove that you're as lovely as their loveliest dentist? Uh, uh, so, um, you know, and th when you start off so far behind in the goodwill, you know, I don't trust her. She doesn't trust me. I got nothing to prove to, to someone like her. And so, let her, let her, um, you know, I'm sure there's a there's a long queue of dentists waiting to see her. I'm sure there is. So, she can just move on to the next one, can't she? Jog on, yeah. All right, okay. That's how you stay happy in this job. You know, you just can't. You just can't take on the stress. I'm not going to take on the stress. I'm just not at this point. I'm just not. And anyone who, my existing patients who gives me stress will be, will be released. And anyone... Uh, who rings up and gives us so many signs that they're going to cause stress, which as my nurse said to me, it was, you know, you're already stressed. She's only phoned twice. She's already caused trouble. She said, don't think the trouble's going to stop with that phone call. Don't think that, <laughs> that's the end of it. That's not the end of it. That's the start of it. Okay. So like, this is my tip to anybody who's in the profession. There are far more patients than there are dentists. Okay, I know you don't feel like that, but there are. So basically, just curate your patients. Um, you know, pr properly. Get rid of the ones that are uh, you don't like. Get rid of them. And I don't. Then you need to be. Just if you don't feel like seeing them, don't see them. Okay, just tell them that you can't help them, and then they'll move on. You know, they'll. they'll someone will sort them. Someone will sort them out. Or perhaps they'll learn and they'll be a bit less uh, uh, <clears throat> of a stressful patient to the like the, the, the last dentist in the world who will see them. All right. Anyway, uh, I've gone on a bit there, but I'll, um, I'm at work now, so I'll talk to you soon. Bye.